Welcome to the latest episode of The Independent. I'm Pete Sampson, joined as always by co-host Matt Fortuna. A uh, bit of an emergency pod here uh, as Notre Dame has hired Mike Denbrock as its new offensive coordinator. And uh, Matt, we sort of talked about that earlier in this week when Jared Parker departed. But uh, Notre Dame, I think, I mean, I think you'd have to say they went out and got their first choice and took them away from Brian Kelly to boot. So there's there's a lot to unpack here. Didn't even give anyone time to really think about it or react. Um, very uh, uncharacteristic of them in a good way, I would say. Um, you know, we talked about this possibility earlier this week when Jared Parker left for Troy. It was unclear at the time whether or not the ink was dry on Mike Dembrock's extension with LSU. Uh, obviously, it wasn't. And I was told that pretty adamantly after we recorded and leaving Same. open the possibility of him returning to Notre Dame. I believe it was a three-year deal at about $2 million per. I'd imagine Notre Dame's deal to him is going to be in a similar ballpark. Uh, but credit to them for getting it done. Um, I was told repeatedly uh, this was not something they were really going to fully devote all their resources to until after the bowl game. But if the opportunity presented itself the way it did here, um, credit to them for getting it done. I mean, LSU has already put out a press release announcing who their co-coordinators will be for the Reliaquist Reli- Bowl. Um, so this thing happened quick. And uh, again, cr- credit to Notre Dame. I think it's uh, – there's no such thing as a perfect hire. I think we see that everywhere um, at all levels. Uh, the win the press conference hire, I think, only wins you that day. But I do think this checks every necessary box in the short and long term. And now it's about the players going out there and making plays. Yeah, there's no question it's um... – I mean, if you remove the sort of the Notre Dame history there uh, or the Brian Kelly connections, which I'm not saying that you should, but if you did and you ended up with a uh, coordinator who developed a Heisman Trophy winner, had the number one offense in the country uh, in yards per play, points, um, I think yards per carry. Uh, oh, I mean, pretty, it was um, hold on, yards I, per I play. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. I mean, it is. Uh, it's a lot of number ones. It's a it lot. It is. Number one in total offense, number one in scoring offense, number one in yards per play, number one in yards of or plays of 20 plus yards, number one in plays of 30 plus yards, number one in plays of 40 plus yards, number one in third down conversion rate, and they had the fewest punts allowed. And they had the Heisman Trophy winner, and uh, Mike Dembrock was a finalist for the Broyles Award, which goes to the best assistant coach. Um, can't do better than that. Now, I'm not saying it was all pixie dust that Mike Dembrock sprinkled on LSU's offense and made Jaden Daniels go as well as he did this year. Uh, it's about what the Jimmy's and Joe's, not the X's and O's, as the old saying goes. But, uh, boy, I mean, think about the state of Notre Dame football five days ago, Sunday, versus now. Uh, oh, my God. It, it, like, it's just night and day. Um, I mean, there was from, a there by was way, a signing time. day was two days ago. Like that yeah. doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> but like I was thinking back to December first, not that long ago, three weeks, when Rico Flores entered the portal, and you're like, oh man, Notre Dame is getting killed in the offseason. This is a disaster. Um, and 21 days later, you you are hiring away Mike Denbrock from LSU uh to run your offense and essentially give Marcus Freeman everything he needs from a staffing point of view to make Notre Dame a playoff team next year. Um, it, and I mean, even just looking at LSU, what was, there were many things that were wrong with Notre Dame's offense last year, but when they went away from Notre Dame and played good teams, they were a hot mess. LSU, they scored 24 on Florida state, 49 on the road at Ole Miss, 49 at Missouri and 28 at Alabama. I mean, those were games where Notre Dame last year was scoring seven, 13, seven. I mean, it was just yeah, like, I, and that's like, and I realize Jaden Daniels has a ton to do with that, but like men, Mike Denbrock has been through a storm before and figured out how to get an offense to the other side of it, or he's just been the storm himself, like this year in particular. So it's, I'm not saying Notre Dame is going to have the number one offense in the country next year, probably not even close. But you're going to take the show on the road to Texas A&M and believe you're going to win now. Whereas if it was last year's staff back, I would argue that you'd go into Texas A&M hoping you can just get to 17 points. And that's just a completely different mindset from where they were. Yeah, I don't know if I go that far at either realm. I mean, 
the four games you mentioned, the LSU lost three of them, and the fourth one they beat Mizzou. I, I want to say on a late defensive touchdown, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, a lot of what LSU did this year on offense was stuff they had to do because their defense was so bad. And fortunately for them, they had the horsepower on offense, particularly at quarterback and at receiver, to essentially take their shot and say we're going to outscore anyone. Now, the Alabama game, Jaden Daniels did get hurt, and that certainly changed the tenor of the game, although they were losing at the time. He did go down. Um, the A&M situation now, again, there's so many unknowns with Texas A&M, it's hard for me to, to, to say – this is what they're going to need to do to beat this version of the Aggies. Um, the Aggies made a defense coordinator hire, about to make a defense coordinator coordinator hire themselves, Jay Bateman uh, from Florida. Uh, I've been shocked by that one, frankly. You know, what's funny is Jay Bateman was singled out when he was at Army for Wakey Leaks. Mike Elko was on Wake Forest staff during Wakey Leaks. Ooh. So the idea of those two breaking bread um, is interesting. Although I, I thought I was looking at that from the standpoint of, it was going to be Jared Parker versus Colin Klein. You're one of your first choices for OC versus the guy you hired. And now it's Mike Denbrock versus Colin Klein. And Mike Denbrock was AM's first choice for offensive coordinator. Yeah, that's true. And Colin Klein was hired instead. So it's the Texas AM Notre Dame narrative bowl. Uh it's it's still on. Uh it's but I just think Notre Dame will go there with such a higher level of confidence in what it could be offensively because of this staffing move. Um I absolutely. I don't think you can overstate like just what this means for Notre Dame from a we can beat anybody uh, on any Saturday on next year's schedule. I mean, that's it, they should be in position to make the college football playoff um, because I think in part because of this move. No, absolutely. Uh, also, Riley Leonard against Mike Elko while we're in the, the, yeah. the Notre Dame. Got that too. Cross patterns. Yeah. Um, Look, you've got a guy who's been there and done that. He did it at the highest level possible this year at LSU. He's done it at Notre Dame in a number of different positions over several years. He took freaking Cincinnati to the playoff and beat Notre Dame at Notre Dame to get there. And uh, not that there's correlation, but seeing Desmond Ritter really struggle at the NFL in some ways in hindsight <laughs> magnifies, I think, the work Mike Dembrock and that coaching staff did with him winning as many games as they did with the Bearcats during his run there. Uh, but it completely, it, it absolutely changes the narrative, right? I mean, I think most people's worst fears about last year's offensive coordinator search were proven true through Saturdays this fall. Uh, they went with a safe hire after striking out on their top choices. You thought you had enough horsepower on offense to win most of not all of your games this year. You weren't sure about the play caller and that kind of came to fruition in the big yeah. games, uh, especially against Clemson, against Louisville, against Duke to a lesser extent. Uh, now you don't have those concerns. That's not to say there aren't going to be other problems that arise. There's a lot to be remade uh, with this offense. I mean, we're looking at at minimum eight new starters offensively in their first game against Texas A&M, which again, will be undergoing its own renovation of sorts with entirely new coaching staff and with a roster that seems like has more players in the portal right now than anyone else. Uh, but you look at that schedule, and again, at USC end of the year, okay, we have no idea what the Trojans will look like next year. We have no idea what they'll look like on the last game of the season. Uh, Florida State at home. Um, let's hope there's still an ACC for Notre Dame to have their yeah. Olympic sports in by that well, point. After Florida State, I was just going to say, like, we got a question from Hank, and you're sort of starting to answer it now. Um, from the live show chat, Matt and Pete love the show, never miss an episode. Does the Denbrock hire change the ceiling win total for next year's team? As and you've already sort of gotten into AM, Florida State, and USC. I mean, I think we, we'd have to agree that yes, this is this is something that changes the over-under on what Notre Dame's win should be in 2024. I would completely agree. Um, I'm curious what that number would be when it comes out in the summer or would have been, you know, without Mike Denbrock versus what is now. And, and let's not, I don't want to make this simply a Jared Parker versus Mike Denbrock thing, although resume wise and familiarity wise, I think uh, we can all agree Notre Dame got an upgrade in that department. Uh, the fact that Parker left on Monday and we're here on Friday talking about uh, this thing, being done. Um, LSU putting out a press release themselves saying this thing is already done is very noteworthy. Uh, you know, 
for, for a number of reasons, right? And uh, we could talk about last year's OC search versus this year's OC search. Again, night and day. Um, I put this out there uh, on Twitter on Wednesday during signing day. Marcus Freeman's signing day press conference of the overall tenor around Notre Dame and NIL and recruiting this year versus what it was last year, which was the first and to my knowledge, recollection, only signing day press conference in the history of signing day press conferences where the head coach looked like he was visibly frustrated and didn't want to be there because everything's all roses on signing day. Um, just the overall structure and tenor of this program. And I'm not saying it's going to absolutely result in 10, 11, 12 wins next season. Uh, but the comfortability and confidence that I at least have and that I sense the fan, fan base has about Notre Dame football right now versus where it was 11 months ago, 12 months ago is just – complete 180. Oh, there's no question. It's the, the signing day press conference a year ago was basically Marcus Freeman, not calling out for help, but that's what it felt like. Right. And this year was, I've got, I've got the ammo now to do this. Um, I think from an NLA point of view, Notre Dame is so much more sophisticated now than it was a year ago. Um, I think they've learned what to do, what not to do, how to raise money, um, you know, where it needs to go, how all that, the development of that, of fun from year over year has been immense. I think the comfort of Notre Dame with fund and promoting it has been a big change. And I think you're sort of seeing a head coach that feels like, all right, I've got, I've got all the weapons I need here to, to go out and get it done. And but I also think like Marcus Freeman, he learned a lot too in the last year where it's like you think about Notre Dame's quarterback of choice last year was Dante Moore. That was the guy that Notre Dame thought like he's going to be the one that is committed to us and leads us to the promised land. And he goes to Oregon and then to UCLA and now back to Oregon. And you contrast that to CJ Carr, who opted into practicing for the Sun Bowl. <laughs> It just that's it's just an immense difference from where they were a year ago. I think in terms of understanding who fits here, why they fit here, and then going after them. Somebody like uh, Kingston Villama Asa from from California, who you beat USC and Ohio State to get, who's got I think a four point two GPA, gave a pretty passionate speech about why he chose Notre Dame, and thanking um, you know the people at St. John Bosco, which is one of the preeminent high school football programs in the country, like they went out and found some guys that they didn't have to beg to stay. You know, the, the big signing they flipped last year was Peyton Bowen who flipped to Oak to Oregon and then Oklahoma. I can't, I can't even keep track. Uh, of oh, no. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, you're yeah, right. Just what it is like, a, what a, a show that was. And there was like the best signing days for Notre Dame. I realize everyone loves the Manti Teo signing day if you're a Notre Dame fan, but the best signing days for Notre Dame are the ones that you don't remember anything that happened. Because, and this is this is something Brian Kelly said, and it really stuck with me. Signing day should really be the the least interesting or least important part of your college career. Um, and I think that you see signing day when it's dramatic, it feels very rushed, uh, harried, uh, at times like unprofessional, grab bag. Um, those are not traits of players that traits. Uh, Look at you, Brian. Yeah, I know. Like, we're getting BK deep here, but. Those are just not things that play well at Notre Dame over a three or four or five or six year college career. Um, you, you, Marcus Freeman talked about how like, hey, he wants people to choose Notre Dame, not for a coach. And I, mean, I think when he got here, people were choosing Notre Dame for Marcus Freeman. Um, and I think even that he's evolved a little bit in that way, too, of finding people who are better fits here and being able to sell it. Like, again, you got to press on from here. Um, you got to figure out how to find two Kingston Villamasas and maybe a couple CJ cars and things like that. But um, it just felt like a guy who was much more comfortable in his own skin with the everything else uh, at Notre Dame, which is not insignificant, especially for a younger head coach. Yeah. I mean, you knew there would be a learning curve in season. You knew there'd be one off season that probably wouldn't be as visible to, to, to us and to the outside eye. And I think the one thing we saw through year one, or at least that we thought we saw in real time through that first off season after he got the job through that first, you know, on-field season was, you know, if nothing else, this guy's a home run nine months of the year. Like we still don't know about Saturdays. So you can't lose to Marshall and Stanford, but he, he meets with all the right people. Um, he's very active on the recruiting trail. He's likable. He's engaging. He's candidly everything. His couple predecessors at Notre Dame weren't. And that's going to go a long way and give you a lot of goodwill 
when you do stumble on the football field. I would say with the benefit of hindsight, um, recruiting, you know, it's not a, a it is a unique place in Notre Dame. It's not a place where you could say, oh, Clemson, Ohio State, and whoever are doing it this way, why can't we do it like this? Um, that doesn't mean they can't improve their operation, which they have. But, you know, I think Notre Dame probably learned the hard way last year with a case like Dante Moore, right? Like that was yeah. very much a look at us. Like that was all Notre Dame self-inflicted, right? I'm not saying the behind the scenes, you know, him committing elsewhere, the museum, et cetera. I, I'm not going to get into that. I frankly still don't know. All the details of that, but the arranged photo shoots, calling the recruiting reporters to basically sit outside the Goog and take pictures and say, "Look at this five star we got," uh, which you know indirectly turned off a lot of other people. I think they had a more realistic shot at the position that year. Yep. Those are rookie mistakes. Uh, maybe they dodge a bullet by not getting him. Maybe they didn't. You know, we, we you could play the revisionist history game all we want, but I don't see nearly as much of that. You know, kind of showmanship, if you will happening right now this year signing day again was completely different from last year's signing day they finished i believe with the number 10 class on 24 7 sports composite um uh, no one's complaining about that because they got the guys they wanted i don't think they had a flip since september if i'm not mistaken um uh, and- july they didn't have one after july after july okay even better yeah. and <clears throat> it was Hey, we're all in this together. We're all on the same page. And oh, by the way, we're very active in the transfer portal. Like, again, it's not just getting Mike Dembrock 72 hours after you have a vacancy at that position. It's getting Riley Leonard the second he goes in the transfer portal. It's it's knowing you're going to get Riley Leonard and doing the homework you got to do behind the scenes beforehand to get him. Uh, All this points to an operation that's acting like a serious football power. And... Notre Dame's always had some of that, but there always seemed to be something else at play or something else that was holding them back. And maybe it was the previous head coach being over the place. Maybe it was a new head coach not knowing we didn't know. Uh, I do think sitting here on Friday, December 22nd, uh, everything is very, very healthy. And now I'll shut up until Al Golden leaves for the NFL. In, in six <laughs> Stop weeks it. We're Stop wondering it. what the hell is going on with the D.C. Search. But right now, well, I can really, really good. I can I can say this like Notre Dame is working on an extension for Al Golden. So well, that's not LSU to say, was working on one for Mike Dem. <laughs> yeah, right. That's not to say that uh, he will be here forever. Uh, that the NFL won't come calling. But again, it's a Notre Dame being a little bit more all in. Uh, I think on this stuff and giving Freeman everything he needs uh, to early everything that it seems that he needs to to compete. Um, all right, our next question from the live chat: Sean Gannon. How do you see Freeman's influence on Denbrock's schematic and play calling decisions? Does Denbrock's experience allow Freeman to give him more control than perhaps was given to Tommy Reese or Jared Parker? Uh, Tommy Reese probably had too much control during his year under Marcus Freeman as OC. I, I would imagine Jared Parker probably did too. Um, and I say that in a sense, like I don't, Mark Freeman was not involved with the offensive game plan pretty much. I mean, he was about as removed from it as a head coach could be in his first year. Yeah. It was, com- I, I it was comparable to Brian Kelly in the defense. Yes. I imagine it was similar this year. I don't know that. He also has a deeper, longer relationship with Jared Parker. So, you know, he could have been more hands-on. I, I don't know. Um, but again, I said this on previous podcasts. Like, I, I, I don't and never really did and definitely – now do not subscribe to the notion of, hey, this is the head coach of offense. This is the head coach of defense. Marcus Freeman's going to have more oversight over Al Golden and Mike Mickens at that side of the ball. Like I, I don't buy that. I think he needs to be heavily involved. I think they need to play complementary football, uh, something else you probably didn't do all that well last year out of necessity. Um, I, I do think there's a relationship there, however. These guys were both coordinators for the same boss for several years in Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. So more or less – I would guess more by default, but I don't know how much more that would be. Yeah, I would say that it it definitely puts Freeman in a position because of Denbrock's experience that he should not have to feel as involved in it. He should have probably more confidence that Denbrock can figure out something that's going wrong than he did with Jared Parker based on their track records. Um, I... I do think we're in a spot with college football now, especially probably here, 
that I mean, your coordinator needs to be your head coach of offense, and the other one needs to be the head coach of defense because the head coach, head coach, is a head coach of everything else, and the everything else is just massive here, um, as it is for a lot of places. But whether that's working with NIL to make sure that the transfer portal is is open and Notre Dame can do business there, whether that's meeting with people on campus, whether that's just you know the plain old high school recruiting parts of it. Um, I think that's where Marcus Freeman really shines. And I think with Denbrock, you're go- you've eliminated the end of the first half against Wake Forest. You should, you know, the game management of the offense just got a lot better um, with Mike Denbrock coming in as your offense coordinator. And I think Marcus Freeman can feel a- more confident that like, okay, this will get done. Um, I don't think he's going to have to calm down Mike Denbrock on game days because he's getting too animated. I don't think we're going to see shots of Mike Denbrock in the press box on game day, like looking at his play card with sort of an exasperated look on his face. Like, I just think that Denbrock's too cool of a customer for that. Um, and he's, he's done it. He's had success. He's failed. Um, I do think like, imagine, you know, when we, when we were both at the athletic a year ago, when we put together our list of candidates to replace Tommy Reese, we wouldn't have thought to put Mike Denbrock on there at all. Um, and think about like what a, a glow up of he's had of sorts in the last year to go from like a good offensive coordinator to like the guy that we're describing as a home run hire. That is a, that is a hell of an ascent in 12 months. Yeah, it is. Um, I think part of that too is like LSU entered this year with national championship expectations, rightly or wrongly. So it, it would have made less sense on paper to leave that situation to go with a guy coming off his first year as a head coach who just lost four games. Um, definitely Denbrock's Q rating has grown over the last year. That'll happen when you have the Heisman winner. I uh, want to go back to an earlier point you mentioned uh, about play calling and head coaches. The last head coach to win a national title, Colin plays. Oh. Who is it? I don't know. Uh, the last two, I believe, were rivals in the same state. The last one is currently unemployed and richer than all of us combined, Jimbo Fisher. Uh, oh. And I believe Steve Spurrier was the last one before that. Uh, really? I think so. I, I, you'd have to – I'd have to go back and look between Spurrier and Jimbo, but I believe, I know Jimbo was the last one. I mean, it's I just guess not – Nick doesn't call plays, so that eats up a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dabo's never been a coordinator. He won a couple yeah. titles. Kirby <clears> – <throat> You know, Kirby Smart's an interesting case, right? Like, I keep coming back to I remember talking to a, a former player when Kirby Smart snuffed out a fake punt by Ohio State in the uh, college football playoff last year. Uh, the replay showed him locked in fully, recognizing something to miss and calling a timeout right before it happens. And I remember talking to a former Big Ten football player who said, you know, that's what Ryan Day needs to do. Like, he needs to give up play calling – and become the head coach because if you're if Kirby Smart's calling plays right now, he's not identifying that which they tried right. to run against Michigan in their last game. Like there's just so many other moving parts to it, and it's going to be even more interesting, I think, now that we will likely see headset communication uh, between coaching staffs and and quarterback and and one defensive player. We're already seeing it as a kind of a trial run right now uh, with some of these smaller bowl games. I'd be surprised if we don't see it nationally through all 133 FBS teams for every game next year. I wonder how that might change things up for coaches and players. Uh, but, but, you know, I do think, especially at a place like Notre Dame, um, you need to be, you need the head coach to be the head coach. You need play callers on each side of the ball to worry about their units. And I don't know whether this is related to that or not, but anytime you see something happen, like what happened at the end of the Ohio State game this year, with 10 men on the field. Like those are the thoughts that start crawling through your mind about standard operating procedure, chain of command protocol and how something like that could slip through the cracks. Yeah. There's a lot of truth to that. Um, yeah. It's just, I think with, with Denbrock, I, I think another factor that I sort of glossed over at the beginning of the pod, just because I wanted to get into the, the more X's and O's and statistical points of view are just like, his familiarity with Notre Dame also has a value. Um, he spent 10 seasons here, not all of them good, many of them not good. Um, you know, he was here for the rise and fall of Tyrone Willingham. Um, you know, Denbrock's last season here was 2016, um, which was, you know, the, the, the four and eight year. 
Uh, he's also been here when things have gone incredibly well, um, you know, being on staff in, in 2012. It's, you know, so I just think he gets this place. He gets what works here, what doesn't. Um, I can tell you that I remember distinctly sitting down with him um, for like, like a bowl media day. It was in the old Loftus Center and him talking <laughs> about how it took Brian Kelly a while to figure out that you have to run the ball at, at a place like Notre Dame just because like that's what the DNA of this place was. And like just to have a coach who understands what this place is about, like historically, um, you know, culturally, all like all of that matters. Um, Cause it's just, I mean, we've covered a, enough coaches here that they come in and sort of like fight the machine. You never win that battle at Notre Dame. Um, and Mike Denbrock knows how to, to make that work for him opposed to trying to change it. And I think there's, there's some real value to that. It reminds me in a more schematic sense. And again, I don't know the nature of Denbrock and Freeman's relationship all that well. Obviously, they work together. They had a lot of success together. I don't think Mike Denbrock would be coming to Notre Dame to work for him and leave a guy whose wedding he was in, you know, if he didn't have a good relationship with Marcus Freeman. But it reminds me a little bit, um, and I believe you wrote this, uh, when Brian Kelly made Chuck Martin the offense coordinator ahead of the 2012 season, it was similar, right? I, and Mike Denbrock – much more involved in terms of X's and O's on the offensive side of the football than I think Chuck Martin ever was. However, Chuck Martin was a very good kind of safety valve for Brian Kelly to do exactly what you just said. No, we're running the damn ball. It's third and one. Yeah, it's like, like oh, you're going to listen to me because you've been with me 20 years. Yeah, I wouldn't say – I wouldn't use the term safety valve. I would say like uh, sort of what the hell are you thinking? Um, like <laughs> In Chuck's was, case, yes. <laughs> yes. Chuck would tell Brian Kelly to shut the hell up. We're going to do what I said. And but they would get the, into On the some, schedule next year, by the way, Chuck. Yeah, they, I mean, they would get into some epic, epic screaming matches. Um, but Deb Brock can do the same in a much... Yeah, but I don't think Marcus man. Freeman needs that no. um, as much as probably Brian Kelly did. But you need... But you Denbrock need somebody on your staff that tells you to like shut the hell up. This is what we're going to do, and I think Denbrock's going to do that for Marcus Freeman as well. Yeah, right. In in so many kinder words, because that's yeah nature. Like he, yes, he can very calmly and in a more appropriate fashion say like, no, this is not going to work here. This is what we need to do. I've seen this <laughs> before here. It does not work. I will also say, uh, you know, during the talk over the last forty eight to seventy two hours of. Hey, is he, would he come? Why would he come? Why would he leave LSU? The guy has had a knack for reading the tea leaves, uh, so to speak, and looking out for what's best of his career. Because I, I, he could have had a job after 2016 at Notre Dame. It was not going to be in uh, the same capacity he had had previously, which was essentially play caller. I know he's only offense yeah. coordinator in title in 2014, I believe. Um but he, he had a job for Brian Kelly. He opted to start at ground zero with Luke Fickle uh, at Cincinnati. And that worked out tremendously for him. He's now leaving LSU after losing the Heisman winner. Um, after having three losses with the Heisman winner. Uh, and going into an SEC that's going to be tougher than ever with Oklahoma and Texas coming aboard next year. Uh, at a place that, let's face it, like, Brian Kelly will ultimately be judged at LSU by whether or not he wins a national championship, rightly or wrongly. That's the they'll justify him leaving Notre Dame, and it's the only way that fan base will ever wrap their arms around him because the last three guys before him did it. Regardless of how much more difficult it is to do in this era of the SEC than it was in previous eras, and so I just thought and think, you know, Mike Mike Denbrock is making this move because it's a smart move for him, and he sees at least for him the situation at Notre Dame being much better in the near and probably long-term future than it would be for him at LSU. Um, be curious what LSU does to replace him. I know they announced co-coordinators for the game. I'd imagine one of those guys gets the job full-time and they make an outside hire. Um, I believe Mike Dembrock informed Brian Kelly last night that this was the way he was leaning. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess it went smoother than when Tommy Reese told him I'm not coming with you uh, to LSU uh, two years ago. Uh, but that could not have been an easy conversation, especially after, again, Texas A&M made a serious run at Denbrock to be the OC. I believe Mississippi State made a, a run at him, probably not as serious. Um, but he agreed to a three-year extension 
to stay yeah. at LSU. <clears throat> they did not sign to stay at LSU. Yeah, I believe that. I mean, my understanding is that it would have been signed if, like, if this had all happened in February, that deal would have been signed. Um, but it just it had not made it up to the board level at LSU yet um, to be ratified or whatever term you want to use to make it officially official. Um, and that allowed Notre Dame to to swoop in. I I don't know if I, I don't know if Denbrock would have left for any other school either, right? Like I don't. There's I mean, not. He didn't not, right? Yeah, I already said no to others. Yeah, it's like if Sharon Moore left Michigan, I don't think he's like, well, I want to go to Michigan to work for Jim Harbaugh. Forget the other part of the Jim Harbaugh that he may not even be there. But I'm just saying, like, I just. I don't think Denbrock was looking to leave LSU. And it's, I mean, it's interesting when you mentioned sort of reading the tea leaves. I mean, my understanding when he was at Notre Dame under Brian Kelly, he turned down the head coaching job at Central Michigan to stay with Kelly only to get demoted a year later. Um, hmm. So I think he has definitely had some spots in his career where kind of stuff's hitting the fan a little bit. And I mean, we, we've all covered coaches that are – you just can't get the timing quite right. And we, we wonder like, why can't this person get back to being a power five OC or DC um, because of the work that they do? Like you just, it's right place, right time. Um, And I think, you know, for, for Notre Dame, this is the right place, right time to bring Denbrock back for Mike Denbrock. It's the right place, right time to go back to Notre Dame. Um, I think we said this probably on the previous show. I know I wrote it this week. Like, I don't think you can undersell the fact that he's, from two hours from here uh, in Homer, Michigan, it's the middle of nowhere um, sort of South of battle Creek. Like that's the fact that he, he knows this area and that's, you know, it's from the state of Michigan. Uh, I think that all just makes the fit easy and comfortable for him in a, in a way that it wouldn't have for roughly any other offensive coordinator candidate that Marcus Freeman could have hired. And that's not to say like, you know, Kirby Moore ultimately, might have been the better hire, but in terms of who you want to win with right now. He actually now, signed an extension yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Missouri was on their stuff. Um, but who like who gives you the best chance to win right now? Like Mike Denbrock is number one on that list. Yeah, and it's it's crazy this got done as quickly as it did to the point where we're not even really talking about a search. Like there wasn't a search. Like, no, this happened quick. They got their guy. This does not happen often in this business. It rarely, if ever, happens at Notre Dame. Um, again, I mean, it's it, like the last time it happened, they hired Marcus Freeman as their defensive coordinator. Yeah, but even then, that was a little similar. I mean, it was similar to this, but it was longer than this, right? I mean, yeah, but I mean, that I remember how shocked I was that like Notre Dame actually like got the deal done for that because it just, I just don't. It's it's hard to get your number one choice in these situations, and here they are. They did it with Freeman for sure, uh, but then now to do it with Denbrock as well, I think is is pretty impressive. In both times at the expense of LSU, I mean, yes, I want to say it was the day Freeman officially did join Notre Dame, like that morning. It might have been the day before, but like there were published reports saying he's going to take the LSU job, and everything yeah. gathered in real time. And since then, was that was accurate? LSU had him; they thought they had him. Something changed at the eleventh hour. Notre Dame came in. Mike Denbrock had agreed to an extension with LSU. Uh, had that thing been signed, and once you see reports of it being agreed to, usually it's signed or, or damn near close to being signed, he's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, it didn't get signed. It gave him the opening to come back to Notre Dame, which, again, <laughs> I know they lost their head coach to LSU, and at the end of the day, that's probably the biggest thing, but they have pulled a couple fast ones on the Bayou Bengals uh, over the last couple of years here, at least in the coordinator department. And that's got to be wholly satisfying for, for Notre Dame. And let's face it, they're certain, if not a lot of people in South Bend right now. Yeah, we got our guy, but we stuck it to Brian Kelly while getting our guy. And that makes it that much sweeter. For them. I mean, who says you needed the Rely Quest Bowl to, to beat Brian Kelly? It's, it's completely unnecessary. Think about all the drama that, uh, yeah, God, where, where we were on that three weeks ago versus where things ultimately are right now with the state of both programs. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it is, it is wild. Uh, but yeah, I'd, we didn't mention this at the top of the show, but if you're listening to the independent and joyous, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, as always, you can find the podcast on Apple, on Spotify, um, 
wherever you get your podcast. Uh, we haven't done a ton of these live shows, but uh, the Mike Denbrock news certainly warranted it. Um, so I guess, I don't know. You what? We talked about how it maybe changes the the win total for Notre Dame next year. Like, what's what do you think the biggest challenge for Mike Denbrock is coming back here? Figuring out what offense he wants to run, tailoring the talent on hand to his system, so to speak, and making that all mesh as one because at best you're going to have eight new starters there. You're going to have a starting quarterback who is experienced and is athletic and is talented, but, you know, was much more renowned for running the football than he was throwing the football last year. You got a completely new receiving core that as improved as it should be, um, it ain't going to be what he worked with at LSU last year. Right. Um, getting, you know, for, for as much as we've just harped on the familiarity with Notre Dame, uh, I don't know if he's worked with anyone on that side of the ball before, right? I mean, Rudolph, McCullough, uh, Mike Brown. Uh, Mike Brown, he probably did at Cincinnati, yeah. actually. Yeah, he worked uh, with Gadouli and Mike Brown at Cincinnati. Goodell, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I take that back. Uh, but, but again, fitting into the place, adjusting to the place, right? I mean, obviously it's worked out pretty smoothly over the last two plus years here since Marcus Freeman took over, but I'm sure you heard plenty as did I that first off season. And these weren't complaints so much as just like pointing out reality in real time was like, you know, people from the administration side or the academic side would say like, I know Marcus Freeman wants to do this, but this is how it works here. And we're going to have to like yeah. meet somewhere in the middle. They appear to have reached that much quicker and smoother than <laughs> anyone I think could have imagined. But Mike Denbrock's got to get up to speed with that. And I'm sure working on SEC power will help him do that as well. Uh, but but those are kind of the, the big picture questions I have as he gets ready to get back on campus here. Yeah. And it's, I mean, look, the what they do at receiver with Mike Brown will be fascinating because internally um you know talking to people who know how marcus freeman sees this privately um he feels like the receiver room is better today than it was last season um even better be even, <laughs> yeah he's, yeah it's, which is not saying a lot but it's a it's a huge upgrade there and not only does marcus freeman like the receivers that they're coming in riley leonard likes the receivers that are coming in too and i'm not sure sam hartman in a honest moment ever really meshed with what was available to him at Notre Dame short of maybe Jaden Thomas and for the first half of training camp. So that's, that is a significant change too, because it, uh, Mike Denbrock is a hell of a coach, but it's difficult to microwave an offensive system uh, in one off season and have it look great out of the gate. And when Marcus Freeman talked about, you know, continuity and valuing that the Monday after Stanford, like, sort of take some of that at face value where he, the idea that Al Golden's system got better from year one to year two was legitimate. I, I think that we saw that happen. And I'm not saying that Jared Parker's that was, I didn't understand that as a move for Jared Parker. I'm just saying it's a, it's a belief and evidence that year one can be a little bit rocky in spots uh, because it's hard to get an entire offensive system down in one off season on top of a new strength coach um, and a new quarterback and two new receivers, uh, you know, an entirely turned over offense. Like that's, that's a big challenge. I just think that Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame in general believe that they have got more material on hand now offensively than what they did last year, which we'll see, we'll see if that proves accurate, especially when you lose estimate alt and Blake Fisher, but um, at least at receiver, a position and they feel like they've take, taken a big step forward. But that's, you know, getting that to all click is still a big challenge for Denver. Yeah, I'm surprised we didn't call emergency podcast when Tobias Merriweather committed to Cal yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I wonder why we didn't do that. It's, Every time he's in the news, something big coaching movement happens. I believe he was in the living room with Brian Kelly when that's true. <laughs> Kelly took the LSU job and here we are two years later. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable we're sitting here talking about this again. I believe Notre Dame was true in their intention to focus fully on the bowl game for now and then dive into a full fledged search for their OC afterward. Uh, the fact it came together as quickly as it did 
very, very impressive. Uh, and like, <laughs> it's hilarious. Like Marcus Freeman during his signing day press conference. So there's no timeline. I don't want to put a timeline on this hire. We're going to do a nationwide search. Okay. Everything I was told inside and outside that building was, yeah, I know that sounds cliche, but no, we're, they're, they really want to get this 10th win. That's, that's where their focus is right now. And hey, I mean, <laughs> you look at last year's search and again, that was kind of your worst fear as much as people, most people wanted Parker gone. It was, okay, but like, do they know what they're doing? Are they going to have a process in place? Are they going to properly identify and vet candidates and know the financials, yada, yada, yada. And here they are, again, days after losing their OC to head coach. Again, you couldn't have drawn this up, this week up any better for Mark. No, Street. no, absolutely. And I don't know who's most responsible for this. In some ways, I think uh, Brent Jones, the Troy AD, probably is, but... Yeah. Like it just the way this all came together from Monday to Friday, uh, the day before Festivus, where I'm sure we'll find something to grieve about with this program and the rest of college football tomorrow. Uh, it's it's about as positive as it gets. And uh, oh, by the way, they're going to be playing a football game, I think, a week from today, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think maybe we can come back next week uh, after Christmas and talk a little bit about the uh, the Sun Bowl and the festivities in El Paso. Um, I'll be flying down there, I think on Wednesday. Uh, so quick 72 hours in El Paso game Friday. Um, but we, yeah, we'll, we'll come back. How about Thursday? Sound good for you next week? Sure. I actually just realized I'm, I think I'm flying the day of the game. I better make sure my flight isn't. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Going to LA for the Rose Bowl. Uh, but I am, uh, I made sure to book our favorite Manhattan beach hotel as well. Hopefully. <laughs> Have similar fun to what we've had on previous Notre Dame USC road trips. It's a good, it's a good spot without you guys. Um, yeah, I need to look into that now. That's just completely to me. That's like there's Christmas, there's New Year's, and oh, by the way, you turn on your TV and there's a random bowl game on every night. And uh, I, I'm I'm very much looking forward to these sights, at least on TV of the Sun Bowl. I think it's one of the more unique second tier, if you will, third tier, whatever non New Year Six bowl games. I think in any other normal era, this would be a very exciting matchup between two top 20 teams. And now it's exciting for different reasons because you get to see and learn a lot about Steve Angeli, for better or for worse. Yeah. No, it's a, we, I, Steve Angeli will be interesting. Charles Jagasa will be interesting. Uh, will Mike Denbrock be at the game? Well, that will be interesting. I mean, if they can get Mike Brown hired and coaching receivers for the game, like, let's get Denbrock out there. Uh, call some plays. Maybe we can finally get the uh, Tim O'Malley double reverse pass in the red zone that uh, we couldn't get last season. It, it will be uh, it, if he were to be there, and I don't think he will. Wouldn't it be just like the weirdest thing ever if Notre Dame hired an OC and a week later had him coach a bowl game in Oregon State? Couldn't even have its new head coach who they promoted from within be the head coach for that game. Uh, yeah. It, and the amount of weird stuff going on with this game, that's still, that's pretty high on the list. And I, I do not understand that one at all. Like you can't, you can't prepare for a game while hiring a staff. That's it's a bit, a bit baffling to me. Very, very weird, but um, hopefully but it's yeah. good. Yeah, it should be fun. Well, we'll get into all that next week. Uh, today was emergency Mike Denbrock, OC, uh, Notre Dame hiring one of Brian Kelly's top assistants away to complete Notre Dame staff. And it, Notre Dame looks like a much better playoff contender in 2024 today um, than they did 48 hours ago. Um, I think that's that's pretty fair to say. We'll see where it all goes. We've got plenty of future episodes of The Independent to come on all that, and you can get them all on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. So, Matt, unless you have anything else, um, I'm I'm here to wish you a very Merry yeah. Christmas. Well, Merry Christmas to you and a uh, happy birthday to Brian Pullian. I know he listened to the old show and he's oh. at name. I don't know if he's listening right now, but if he is. That's a pretty good chance he will have listened to the show, I think. So we'll see. Maybe maybe LSU brings him back as OC. I don't know. Mm, could be. We'll see. Uh, yeah. On that note, thanks to all, all of you listeners uh, this year. Um, thanks for hopping on on this Friday uh, to talk a little Notre Dame, Mike Denbrock, and the future of the OC position. Um, so until Matt and I return post-Christmas, um, to talk probably Oregon State. <laughs> What's that? I said probably. Probably post Christmas. Yeah, Matt. We'll see if Matt's flights can get coordinated. Um, he's Matt. Well, I just need, there could be new. The, the oh, new God, cycle yeah. There will be no more emergency podcast, Matthew. 
Uh, so until then, Matthew, he's Ben Chicago. I'm Pete South Bend. Tyler, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for being with us on the latest episode of The End of Bend.